Hello, nice to see you again. My name is Heska, coming to you from the Lighthouse in the YSI Plenary. We're about to get ready for another session of this first day of our YSI Plenary, and the next session is held in the Inequalities Constellation. We're so excited that you're with us, and it's worth mentioning, actually, from all the different places that you have come to tune in. We have a map over here in the studio, and it's incredible to see the span of countries that you're covering. Just to do a few shout outs, we've got Australia, India, Nepal, Russia, Finland, Sweden, South Africa, Bolivia, Peru, Brazil, Argentina, Canada. Honestly, I could list the entire globe almost if I'm looking at this picture. You can also tweet us where you are if you hashtag YSI Plenary. We'll see your comments and we'd love to get your shout out and see where you're from. Now, let's move on to the next session. This session is a bonus session because it's got not just one, but two speakers coming to you. Thomas Ferguson and Ursula Costantini. Again, they are going to be speaking from the Inequalities Constellation. So now is your chance to make yourself over to this constellation. If you're watching from a live stream, it's worth your while to go to ysiplenary.org, log yourself into the plenary system and navigate over to the starry sky then pick the Inequalities Constellation and join the Zoom. This is what really enables you to suggest your questions for consideration to the speakers. It allows you to rephrase questions and to mark your favorites. So join us there. Now, without further ado, let's move on and enter the session. Thank you. We hold these truths to be self-evident and see through. Everyone's invited to the party and they're equal. Equal opportunity for all the party people, regardless of their party or their perspectival people. Yo, but here's the thing though, if we're being really real, we don't seem to all be playing on the same shape playing field. Everybody's game involvement doesn't flow with the same feel. Everyone ain't dealt the same cards, don't just tell me that's the deal, tell me why. Please define this ideal concept called equality. Everyone is equal except that some are born with property. Everyone is equal but some can't afford to lobby the same government that's meant to hold us equal in our sovereignty. Inequality, in inequality Some got it awesome, some got some, some got poverty Did we want its opposite at all? Or speaking honestly, is all this inequality the crux of our economy? Hello everyone Hello everyone, welcome. My name is Magali Brosio and I'm the question moderator for this session. In order to guide our future research, the right questions might first be asked. And this is why we are here today, to settle on the questions that will lead the future YSI collective work. This first part of the session works as a collaborative question incubator. In the graph, you will already see questions that were submitted directly by the speakers in relation to the presentation we're about to listen to. While Thomas Ferguson and Ursula Constantini are talking, you will be muted on the Zoom call, but you are all invited and encouraged to go to the platform and suggest new questions or like questions suggested by others in relation to the talk. The suggested questions receiving the most likes will be passed on to the speakers for comment after the input talk. Moreover, after the talk ends, we will work together on rephrasing them in order to further improve them. Finally, they will be published in this constellation and potentially be selected by you and others as part of the favorite 100 questions. Without further ado, I want to hand it over to Cecilia del Barrio Arleo to introduce our speaker. Yeah. And especially the Supreme Court is going to be a disaster. Well, there's lots of things they won't be able to do. No, it hey, um, yep. So I think we are. Yeah, we got to stop. So, yeah, good. Um, 
Good afternoon, good morning. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to introduce this, um, this great session of the Constellation and the, the Question Fair um, with uh, Ursula Costantini and Tom Ferguson. Uh, my name is Cecilia Del Barrio. I'm uh, the outgoing coordinator for the Finance, Law and Economics Working Group. And yeah, today, as I briefly mentioned, we would have our two um, speakers who will be first um, develop some, um, some of the questions that they have uh, submitted in advance, after which we will have this chance to, um, to actually um, see the relevance of some research questions. So just a um, little introduction on Tom Ferguson. He's a director of research and projects um, in INET, and he's also part of the advisory board. He's also professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And uh, well, he has uh, broadly written um, books, articles, um, also, yeah, authored and co-authored. And we are so excited to, to, have his, uh, to have him here with us. And our second speaker is um, Orsola Costantini. She's uh, now the Economic Affairs Officer at the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, in the Division of, uh, on Globalization and Development Strategies. She has been previously worked as a senior economist uh, in INET. She has um, received her PhD from the University of Pavia, and she has also extensively um, yeah, published in, in very yeah, well-known journals. So now we will be moving to our um, question part. So essentially you, um, you have approximately 25 minutes to um, to develop the, the questions um, that you have previously submitted. So um, I don't know who wants to, uh, to take the lead, or Sula, Tom. Feel or free Sula to... should go first, I think. Right. So this question uh, related to whether uh, economic policies can eliminate conflict. So the floor is yours, Ursula. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for being, letting me be the guinea pig of the situation. Um, but first. thank you, especially, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, especially Cecilia for the introduction and uh, the Young Scholar Initiative for inviting me to be part of this, uh, this quite impressive uh, event that you've organized. Um, so well, thank you to, to SI, the management team, and, and all the people that are participating in various ways to this. Um, and, and especially, I mean, uh, to be part of, of the, the introductory uh, day lineup, uh, it's, uh, I'm very uh, humbled. Um, so my question, uh, I've I actually thought uh, uh, long and hard about what, what I should ask, and uh, everything seemed very reductive. Uh, especially <laughs> uh, given that uh, I, mean, uh, I was I'm facing. Uh, other economists that are uh, you know, thinking about uh, similar issues. So uh, I try to be as general as possible, but go as at some touch something that is uh, at the same time substantial, at least in my view. So I came up with a question that may appear vague, but I'm going to sort of unpack it, hopefully, uh, in this 25 minutes. So the question is, can economic policies reduce or el eliminate conflict? I, th I think that's a more, maybe it's not exact words I used <laughs> when I sent, submitted it, but that's uh, the, the question more or less um, in its meaning. Um, can it, can it uh, reduce or eliminate conflict? And why did I choose this uh, question? Um, I think that I was very much influenced by the current events. The fact that we have all the feeling that we are living in turbulent times, but especially that we are facing more turbulence ahead. And that's precisely, I think, what characterizes the state of uncertainty and, and, and the distress that many of us feel uh, at, at this time. Um, and um, at the same time, we see that Facing this, this uh, pandemic, most economists started to agree on a lot of things, to agree on the fact that health should come first, for example, uh, and uh, that 
we should turn to the government to help out in these situations. Um, at the same time, we also see, especially now, so evidently uh, watching the U.S. elections, that the rest of the of the citizens that are not necessarily economists uh, actually have very different views of what <laughs> should be done. And, and there's actually a huge divide, a po huge political divide that we see that not only in the U.S., in the U.S. we are seeing this quite dramatically. Um, and I think that Tom is going to talk about that. Um, but we've seen this in the rest of the world as well. So we have these tensions that are, some are underlying and we see them that might explode, might explode and probably will explode in the future. We see that there's, there are many different, there are actually polarized views about what to do. And as economists, we are paradoxically seeing some agreement, more agreement than before on some uh, key issues. And especially we are seeing that uh, economists actually have broken the taboo of uh, monetizing public debt, for example, uh, doing unconventional monetary policy, so aggressively using central banks and uh, lenders, of, lenders of rest resort. Um, we see that we uh, that most economists, if not all economists now say that the government should not only spend now, but also in the future uh, years because the recovery is not going because the, the recovery is going to take a long time. Um, so the question that, can, that, I, that I posed here, essentially to me means uh, it's easy to agree as economists right now on these points, but we should not uh, forget to uh, analyze the consequences of those that appear as emergency measures, measures that we all agree on because they're necessary right now, and really focus on what are policies that can, uh, that can really reduce uh, conflict, uncertainty, and crisis if they exist. So that's the type of question that I think as economists, we should ask ourselves right now. And it's not a new question. It's a question that I, I would argue, for example, Keynes above all uh, asked himself uh, after the war, uh, World War II, or even before arguably, but uh, after World War II, not only Keynes, but I mean, or also Harry Dexter White uh, or, or many other economists were thinking, how can we avoid the type of conflicts and, and, uh, that emerged before uh, in, the, in, the 19, in the 20th century uh, that brought to so many so, so many wars, so much war and, and, uh, and despair. Uh, we also uh, know that that experience, as much as we need to study it uh, and, and learn from it, has not been result has not sold, has not really given an answer to that question. So the problem, and the problem is also that the world has evolved. So those answers couldn't, even if they worked then, might not work now. So the question is uh, really, uh, okay, we can do certain things that can help and ease uh, perhaps uncertainty or short-term uh, uh, distress, but how can we really build an architecture that reduces conflicts, if it is possible. And so in order to unpack this uh, an answer, to try to, to develop an answer to this question, I thought of mainly three economists, uh, Ricardo, Marx, and, uh, and Keynes. Um, and those are sort of representative of three types of conflicts that uh, the economists have uh, identified. One, uh, Ricardo uh, is uh, perhaps the first economist that really talks about conflict between labor and, and, and capital, a distributive conflict. 
And this is an interpretation, of course, that uh, came relatively late of the work of Ricardo, thanks to Zraffa and other, others after Zraffa. Uh, and according to this reading of Ricardo, he, um, he, had the, he strongly believed that there were some equilibrating forces in the, side, uh, in the economic system. But at the same time, he, uh, he recognized that there was a fundamental distributive conflict. The fact that to one productive configuration, there were corresponding multiple distributive uh, configurations. Um, and to solve that problem, he needed an external argument, a non-economic argument, something that uh, had to do from the sense of um, uh, decreasing return to scale or to the, um, to the theory of wages uh, by Malthus, uh, for example, thanks to which he manages still to find a solution that is a st steady state, a steady state where distributive conflict is no longer in place. And he describes the sta uh, stationary state, steady state, as um, as a positive position, it's a, a position in which in, in which uh, the economic actors no longer compete with each other. So a state of peace, let's say. Uh, he also, however. Uh, was not blind to some of the, com the other elements that were happening around him. And one of them was uh, technological progress. And for instance, his uh, well-known essay on machines, uh, for instance, says, where he explained that uh, uh, technological progress did bring uh, eventually, uh, at least for some time, unemployment and did create distributive conflict um, in itself. Um, but uh, the capacity to really see crisis as something endogenous to capitalism only uh, comes, uh, uh, comes out with, with Marx. Um, Marx uh, finds a crisis driven precisely by conflict within the capitalist class and between capital and labor. And, uh, and with the fact that, of course, uh, wages are a cost for capitalists as much as they are a source of demand. Uh, he uh, identifies this as the, where uh, capitalism will eventually uh, doom itself, uh, even though uh, there are some, he identifies also antagonistic causes to the fall in the rate of profit. Uh, those are, um, for example, and this is one I would like to, to focus a little bit on, the possibility to find new markets, to open new market, external markets, which is something that appeases competition domestically. So in that interpret in, in this uh, identifying this source of uh, antagonistic this antagonistic force, uh, Marx uh, starts also talking about the nation state, the role of the nation state in defending domestic capitalism, and in creating a conflict not only in creating a conflict not inside but outside between nation states. And that, as we know, has been one important factor that led to war, to colonialism, and then eventually to World War One and World War Two, conflicting uh, 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 conflicts between nation states and and uh, colonial uh, powers. Um, So why I think uh, this is important, or at least why I am uh, really thinking a lot about uh, this element. Um, uh, Ampassan, I want also to mention the fact that, for example, Kaletsky, Rosa Luxemburg, both Rosa Luxemburg and Mikhail Kaletsky both uh, uh, picked up this specific point from the works of, work of Marx and thought uh, and, and mentioned uh, war and colonial war and imperialism as one important uh, element, in, intrinsic element of capitalism, which needs this sort of activity 
war and and uh, colonization of uh, of external new external markets to to survive. Um, why I think it's important because that leads us to to Keynes and to the attempt after the war to build an international monetary system that could help reduced conflict between nations. And um, I've been thinking about that because as uh, someone who's uh, working at, uh, at Antet and uh, specifically specifically on, on debt, um, this is a, an issue that is, is extremely relevant today. The fact that some countries in the world are drowning in debt which is public, both public and private, but when it's external debt, uh, that whether it's private uh, or, or public doesn't uh, matter much. Um, uh, and uh, there is no automatic mechanism in place that allows these countries to uh, come out of the situation of strain, strain of financial distress. So uh, we know that the, the financial and monetary architecture that uh, came out of the Second World War after it came out thanks to the Bretton Woods Conference is no longer in place. We also uh, know, however, that that very system had some contradictions and didn't work properly. I'm not only talking about the well-known uh, criticism to uh, and, and, and debates between uh, Keynes and, and, and Dexter White, for example. But um, I'm also talking about other um, experiences, such as, for instance, the European uh, pay, um, Payment Union. I recently read uh, this uh, trilogy of articles by um, Joseph Alevi. We need to, to wrap up a little bit because we also, this also comprises the time for Tom, so yeah. Sorry, okay, I didn't realize it was taking so long. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, I, I encourage you to read those, uh, that trilogy because it, uh, it at some point really talks about the payment union and something that helped after uh, World War II uh, return, develop, redevelop uh, Europe, Western Europe, of course, but it also created the, the conditions for those who were doing more industrial policy or a specific industrial policy to, uh, to become more powerful, specifically Germany. So even when a situation, a monetary architecture allows to or help reducing tensions and help uh, countries being in a position to overcome financial strain, even then, we need to take into account what happens on the productive side and the material uh, elements of that. Um, so uh, I think that right now, what we, the instrument that we are looking at and we need to be looking at more carefully perhaps than, um, than often is, is what does it mean to have a land of last resort? Yes, now we know, no one can deny that it's essential to have it. What does it mean? How? Uh, in terms of creating too big to fail and in, in terms of distributive consequences of uh, unconventional monetary policy, expansionary monetary policy. Um, in terms of uh, full employment, uh, we, and we think of uh, employment of last resort or in terms of dis distribution, basic income, what are the consequences of that in terms of distributive conflict? Um, and in terms of international monetary system, how do we design it? Can we design it better than they did after uh, World War II? And how can we at the moment uh, overcome the difficulties, uh, the financial difficulties that uh, especially low-income countries and middle-income countries are facing in terms of their uh, external debt and debt repayment schedule coming up? Okay, great. So many thanks, Ursula, for sharing these uh, insights. And I think there is a lot of uh, food for thought here. And now we have to quickly turn to um, Tom. So um, essentially you have submitted these three questions. Um, I'm not sure whether you would like to focus on specifically one of these, or you would like to kind of tackle the three of them. Um, 
I can. Yeah, I think I'll do. I'll deal with the ensemble if I could all at once. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I don't, I'm not trying to cut you off. I just. Yeah. Would you like to? I, yeah, yeah. I, should, I should just pick up. All right. Well, look. Let me um, begin by. I, I have my misgivings here because I know from mythology that when you're in the constellation, sometimes somebody's trying to honor you. But oftentimes, it's a kind of consolation prize. Something screwed up, and they, you know, some god that you've been close to puts you up there uh, and said, really, sorry, now you can be a, a constellation. I at least will hope not to turn into a meteor, that is to say, worth 30 seconds. Um, so, um, Look, I put in these three questions, right? And they are all actually quite tightly tied together. Uh, well, the first one was about COVID is making countries pile on new debts that increase inequality. Uh, and how do we get quantitative easing for people? The second question was, how do you, the world get to full employment with rising wages in a sustainable way? Uh, and then, uh, well, developed countries are drifting toward affluent authoritarianism and the poorer ones uh, to more traditional forms. That's just sort of some thug uh, just sets up and starts pushing people around. OK, so those are my questions. I think it's pretty easy to toss my prepared script and just watch in the last couple days as, you know, there is, as many of you know, an election underway in the United States. Um, and let me just talk a bit about the new situation in the world and why uh, those questions are going to be pretty urgent. And in particular, I I'll come toward the end of just sort of, or maybe we just get it in a question period. Why would you pick on three practical questions, if you like, rather than deep theoretical questions. The short answer is, of course, there's a bunch of theoretical questions hidden uh, in those. Uh, but look, very simply, um, this state of this planet right now is not so wonderful. Now, here I have to appeal to some facts. Not everybody may not see those facts the same way. I've given a few lectures on this because I was asked at the start of the COVID panic, if I join a group of statisticians under Chatham House rules. And so I've been looking at this stuff and I've given a few talks. There's one on the INET website. Uh, there, but bottom line uh, here is if it's quite striking to me, if you look at the way economists talked about the uh, COVID and its effect on the world in the first few months, you got one impression. If you look at what's actually happening now, you can see there's not too much fit between that um, and what's uh, going on. Uh, and uh, people got to rethink because you're, the world's going over a cliff. Uh, if you uh, look and uh, look very simply, if, if you sort of see what happened, you can see that, well, the Asian developmental states that are used to having government bureaucracies work, they've dealt, you know, they have very low rates of infection. They still get infected from time to time, but it doesn't blow the place out. Now, all of them did uh, testing, uh, contact tracing, uh, and then they isolate folks, sometimes on means that are sound pretty brutal. And I don't just sound pretty brutal, they are. Um, in some cases. Um, and then you got a few countries close to China who shut down immediately. I'm thinking of Australia and New Zealand. You know, there they were close. They'd had experience with SARS. And in some cases, they were very blunt in saying, if we don't shut immediately, we know we're not prepared for this. It's the exact opposite of what some economists have been writing about state capacities and things like that. Um, but um, the thing is, Outside of those countries, this virus is now spread almost, one is tempted to say, uncontrollably. People were arguing about whether you wanted to do herd immunity uh, or something else. Uh, a lot of business interests pitched in on that, uh, going for some version of herd immunity. Uh, but, you know, all of you know that this virus is raging in Europe uh, and everybody is locking down. 
Similarly, we just had in the, in, in the Trump administration, of course, didn't do much effective at all. And in the last six weeks or so, even the White House chief of staff was saying he wasn't even going to try, uh, that her immunity was they're going to have, they don't like it, leave it. I mean, it's still, that's all you're going to get. Um, now, Biden was running in no small part on a different point of view. But uh, he's not going to take office till January, assuming he takes office at all, which we uh, I, I, in the United States, man, I don't count chickens until they're hatched uh, there. All right. Um, but you're sitting, therefore, with the entire developed countries on the planet, basically with this disease out of control again. And clearly the economy is is cratering. Uh, the only interesting question is, you know, do the latest indicators fully reflect the scale of the disaster? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. The leading ones tend to do it pretty fast. This is pretty interesting because, of course, the real meaning of this type of thing is to realize that all this talk about sort of keeping the economy open versus keeping people healthy is uh, something of a pseudo uh, opposition because, in fact, you can't uh, do this. But... Um, all right. There, in the case of the U.S. now, you are, uh, I am taking it for granted, not when what follows, that uh, Biden gets elected president and the Democrats either don't get control of the Senate or they do it on a 50 to 50 basis. And the vice president, and that'll require a miracle in Georgia in January because there'll be more elections. But so where are you at here? What this says is you are looking at a totally immobile system. It's like in a sentence, bye bye Weimar, which everybody was sort of thinking in the background, God, could it happen here? People were even writing essays about that. And welcome to the Third Republic in France. That is to say, this immobile society that does not change. Mark Bloch ended up writing a famous book on it, Strange Defeat, sort of ex uh, explaining why French elites preferred in the end if they couldn't, if they since they weren't willing to make changes, they'd rather, most of them would rather do a deal with Hitler. Um, and they finally did. Uh, that's a long way away. The real point is uh, you've got a completely blocked society, and it is also going to block a lot of world action, not unilateral foreign policy stuff, meaning where the president can act and who's probably going to act in a more uh, uh, normal internationalist way. Uh, but, you know, the, for instance, serious action on climate change, you won't be able to get it through the U.S. Senate. It's just not going to happen. Um, so um, where does this leave us? Well, my reading of this is that in both the U.S. and in Europe, the populations are really angry and they're not going to tolerate this stuff for much longer. Um, the, uh, in the European case, you have 200 lawyers this morning in France writing that, the, you know, the latest uh, state uh, measures on containing uh, COVID are illegal, don't make sense anyway. And I think there is something to their, I said, a lot of European countries have just, besides failing like the U.S. did, to really test um, and follow up and isolate. Um, they've also uh, just not prepared in the health system for a second uh, ground, and they haven't tried to really do intelligent versions of lockdowns. I think that's where there's been a failure. You don't have to shut the whole place down, but exactly what you need to shut is frankly not super clear. And where, the, where is this gonna lead us in the spring? I, France would be my number one candidate, closely followed by Italy or maybe Spain. People are already rioting there. You will see a good deal more uh, turbulence, I think. And in the U.S., well, the crisis is adjourned in the sense that, well, Biden will take over, probably. Uh, and then what are the Democrats going to do? In two years, they will be right back to where Clinton was and to where uh, Obama was. That is to say, probably unable to put through uh, really attractive, powerful policy measures, um, and uh, not, and therefore quite vulnerable. Uh, Republicans obviously know that. That's nothing could be plainer. Um, so what I'm suggesting is, if we don't do better on our macroeconomics uh, there, 
uh, you really need, we can't go on with this quantitative easing stuff. You just, I mean, in effect, what the central banks now do is every time you get in trouble, they basically pump up the stock markets. Um, and then um, they stop uh, until things go down again. Uh, that's that's the Fed case. The European Central Bank case is somewhat more complicated, but you know, deal with that in question periods if you want. Um, and uh, this is, in effect, a strategy that increases the wealth of the richest already, people with a lot of financial assets. It's much remarked. The notion that you can keep doing this with people in real trouble is crazy. Then there is the ugly lesson of the Trump uh, macro policy. This was the one, I'm not sensible, okay, I'll say it, it was sensible. Uh, I think he didn't have any macro theory except a very short-term one, but you could see you need to learn from the Trump experiment. Um, very soon after the election in 2016, we had all kinds of macroeconomists in the United States start advising the Fed to raise rates. Sometimes they did it, but Trump pushed back heavy. They didn't completely succeed in that. But we learned in 2017, 18, and 19 that all of these theories about uh, natural rates of unemployment were way off that people could come back into the labor force, that all kinds of groups that were said to be, you know, just unable to go into the labor, they went in there and they got jobs. Now their incomes went way up. That is, I think, when the, all the smoke clears on the election analysis, is gonna be a major reason why so little votes changed on Trump uh, and a good explanation for some of the shifts that came toward him, though we haven't got time to discuss the American election, at least not now. The point is, we now know that exactly as Ursula, uh, Antonella Palumbo, and others uh, wrote some time ago, uh, central banks and most economists way underestimate potential output. This is a different question from the one about, do we worry about central bank debt in a crisis? Um, and I would caution there that while lots of economists are happy to join that caution right now, I am not guessing. I am quite sure the large numbers are just wait till the elections are over. Wait till the German election is over. For example, in Europe, if the Germans don't take off their, their debt break, and we all go back on that in a year or two, you'll have an, enorm an enormous, probably final crisis in the European Union. Um, and then there is finally the question of authoritarianism. I mean, uh, elites are not really leveling with their populations here. Uh, and everybody knows, everybody can see that in different countries, the same mechanism works, which is it's a reverse Lewis mechanism, as Lance Taylor said in his new book. It's an INET book with Cambridge University Press, um, which is we all thought that you had economies grow by having people come in from low productivity operations in the countryside, go into a city and do a high productivity job. Now they're running this stuff in reverse, except you often stay in the city. That is to say, you just get booted and you go into some low productivity, low wage sector. That is everywhere the case in the US and uh, Britain, I think maybe further, but it happens absolutely everywhere. And the welfare states have been slowly whittled down to do that. Uh, to to not to take less than full effect of this. So what's going to happen? Uh, you know, if you don't get better macro and if you don't build better uh, theories that connect economics to politics, you're looking at uh, really, I think, the collapse of the European Union in a bit, not right away, three, four, five years down the road, because finance ministers, especially in the South, you know, have real trouble, as uh, folks will often say to me in private, you know, we're being told to go build, yeah, we can have the money to go build a hospital now, but in two years to get under the, the old debt ceilings and debt breaks um, and rules on uh, GDP and, you know, primary surpluses, we'll have to dismantle that stuff. That's just crazy. And in the U.S., well, it's now not going to matter what anybody thinks because you're looking at um, stasis, immobilism, uh, and uh, this, is, this is a super mess. And of course, climate change, how do you do climate change in that? In effect, you have, if you like, a little tide in every country 
somewhere out there are their own version of yellow vests saying, look, we can't worry about what's going to happen in 20 years. We got to worry about what's going to happen at the end of the month. Uh, the truth is, is that governments don't have an answer to this. Economists have not been much help in this. And just telling them to go ahead and rescue the rich with quantitative easing, spend what they do, in other words, uh, is not solving anybody's problem either for very long. And on that happy note, I'll just stop. Yeah. Okay. Many thanks, Tom, for, for sharing these uh, reflections. And yeah, unfortunately, we need to um, rush a little bit, but um, we have received some questions in the, um, in the constellation. And yeah, for the sake of time, I will just try to um, choose one or two maybe. And I think this, this one um, sort of puts, puts together two things that we have uh, been mentioning already. And the question says, will, will COVID-19 change power relations among countries? And then we also have a, another question, maybe more in connection with, um, with Orsala's thoughts, uh, which reads, uh, do we need to create policies that solve conflicts or solve the conflicts underlying the structural problems in order to actually solve these conflicts? So now we have roughly 10 minutes. So... Um, you have five minutes each to, to comment. So I don't know if uh, Ursula, you, you would like to start maybe addressing this question or the well, one before. It's I, would... my, I feel that it's my fault just if we are late. So maybe Tom should start. No, I mean, right. it's well, one, in, in any case, it should be mine because I'm moderating. So I'm, I'm the one to blame. So, um, but yeah, I mean, we can go ahead with, with Tom if that's the case. I will make some. And yeah, some signing case, we're running out of time, but you have more or less five minutes yeah. to what? Pretty, sim I mean, pretty simply, is COVID going to change power relations? Of course it is. Um, my take is very simple. I'm not sure it's strikingly new. Obviously, the Chinese have dealt much more effectively uh, with COVID. And, you know, they're clearly going to, they're growing in the rest of the world. You know, where else can you have the big buzz of the week being, how did you shut down an enormous IPO? I'm talking about Ant. Um, the, the, when the rest of the planet has falling stock markets like crazy. Um, on the other hand, I'm not a believer in the China will be all conquering or something like that. I always think that's mostly uh, a good deal of hype. We can argue about it, but you know, it, obviously the Chinese gain. The U.S., though, the notion that the U.S. is on the edge of collapse in international economic terms is pretty crazy. The U.S. digital economy is hugely strong. And it's you know, if you look at what happens in Europe, um, they don't have a digital economy to sort of cut to the heart. They're trying to develop one. And in the context of the crisis in the world automobile industry, which is make, trying to make the shift to electric cars. Uh, this is a pretty serious problem. I mean, famously, Europe and especially Germany exported more um, than, uh, say, the U.S. did um, and other developed countries. A lot of it's cars. And that car industry is going to dry up and it won't blow away, but it's going to massively change. Nobody can say what or how. I, I would observe that INET, uh, once again, we've run a panel on the world car industry. You can find it on our, in Trento, you can find it on our website. But this is just the beginning of a major zoo. There, this, this is a mess. Uh, so I think I should probably stop there. I don't want to swallow all the time, but I'm happy to yield to my colleague. Well, what I can add, uh, because I fundamentally agree with what Tom was saying, is that uh, there are essentially two ways out that I can see. Uh, one is that China grows strong enough so that there can be a countervailing power equilibrium that creates. So the threat of China growing stronger can lead other countries to, uh, to uh, agreeing on a different system. Uh, or we see that uh, uh, there's a super, super national uh, group of multi, uh, multinational corporations that benefit 
uh, and uh, strive. And uh, while some countries uh, really uh, uh, succumb. And we, as we show in the um, trade and development report, uh, the annual report of ANTED, yeah, what's more likely is that uh, we are facing another lost decade. And the term lost decade refers to the string of debt crisis that happened in Latin America, Russia uh, in, the, in the 90s. And, and that's what we are going uh, most likely to, to face. Uh, that being said, um, what, what we come next depends on political choices, but also on what's going to happen to our environment. And that's a variable that uh, if we don't act quickly, we may not be able to control anymore. Yeah, do you want, we have time for another comment or not? Yeah, yeah, we have some, yeah, we have five minutes left more or less. Oh, I don't okay. Know um, one or the, the one in relation to the conflicts and the policies solving those conflicts. I mean, you don't necessarily need to fully answer the question, but sort of reflect upon the validity of the question or the, the relevance of this question as a potential research question. In the spirit of this question fairs and the, and the constellation in which uh, young scholars are essentially trying to distill their research questions. So you're also invited to reflect upon this, this kind of aspects. Yeah, could I try a twist on that question? Um, if you, in, in back of the earlier question about changing power relations, you can hear the Kindleberger question about what happens in a world in which there's no hegemon. Uh, the famous question posed out of his analysis of the 30s. Now, everybody is just taking it for granted that you've got to have this kind of uh, hegemon. There's a huge literature in international relations, much of it bad, and some of it so bad in economics, I can hardly believe I'm thinking of John Mearsheimer, for example, um, there, which just says, all right, if you've got a polycentric world, you're, get, you're doomed to conflict. Now, just think a bit about this. I was on a... Uh, platform with Hajun Chang, my friend from Cambridge, last week, and somebody asked us about hegemony, and he said, look, I'm a South Korean. Every time I hear the word hegemony, it's the Russians, the Chinese, the Americans, or somebody is about to swallow us. Um, there, I'm paraphrasing. And yeah, it's maybe time to start thinking about how do you deal with a world a polycentric world. What's the? It's worth. The, the, there is a, a line of thought coming out of monetary economics that says you got to have a single currency. I think one might try testing that a bit more, and generally getting some thinking besides uh, Kendallberger's reflections, which admittedly makes sense. Anybody can see the logic of conflict that comes out of a polycentric world, uh, but people got to sort of widen their. The question about do, do we try to deal with the uh, conflicts or the theories, hmm, chicken and the egg, uh, is sort of my reaction to this. People are going to have to try to innovate here or you're likely to get swallowed up in some really nasty dynamics. Yeah, well, this is not a very positive note uh, to, to finish, but I think it's, uh, it's encouraging in the sense that, okay. <laughs> yeah, look. Cecilia, if you want a happy ending, you know my standard line, see a Disney movie. I mean, no. No, okay. In any case, yeah, there would be uh, more time for clarifications in the session afterwards. But um, so now for, for this um, first question fair session, we can, um, we can wrap it up here. And um, so many thanks to both uh, of you for, for your time. And actually, yeah, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Ursula was for now the only woman from the, the question fair so far that we have had. So happy to, to have moderated here. And so, yeah, this is it. And yeah, we can continue in the question grab soon afterwards. So thanks a lot uh, to both. And yeah, hope you're, uh, you continue enjoying the, this plenary. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Cecilia. Welcome back, uh, everyone. 
Um, I hope you feel very energized about that after these amazing speakers. Uh, it was definitely a lot of food for thought. Um, and it's now time for a more hands-on part of our session. Uh, until now, you were asked to be muted, but now I'll ask you to take the floor or request the floor if you'd like to make a comment. So we already shared some of the most uh, liked questions that arose from uh, this session um, with our speakers, uh, which was great to hear them comment on them. But even great questions of the one we came up with can be even in further improved. Uh, by some collaborative work. So what I'm going to do now is allow uh, a new feature that's called rephrasing, and we're going to work in all of these questions to try to uh, fine tune them and arrive to a better research question uh, that works better. Uh, we are going to work uh, one by one, and when, we're going to start with the one that was not addressed by the speakers, which is uh, how can economists collaborate with scholars and practitioners working in other disciplines to address the challenges of the post-COVID-19 era. So I'd like to share uh, some thoughts about that. Is anyone willing to add rephrasing or either take the floor and share their thoughts about if this is a good question? Uh, can this question be further improved? Perhaps we could clarify with our other disciplines that are most relevant to our work as economists. I think someone is picking the floor. Hi, Magali, we are migrating. Oh, oh, sounds good. Yeah, so we have who, well, you're going to have to tell us who's talking because. The... <laughs> Okay, we're, uh, we're is it me? Do you want, am I supposed to comment on that or just, I, I was not willing to jump in front of everybody, but I'm quite willing right. to tell you what I think. Uh, I think no one else is uh, seeking the floor, so please go ahead. It will be a pleasure for us to hear you. Well, okay, it may not be a pleasure. Remember, just being in the just being in the heavens may make you crazy. I mean, there is that great Greek saying, whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. Uh, so here I am in the stars. Um, the um, I'm not sold, actually. I know this is um, uh, not the standard approved view. That's tough. Uh, the uh, The question is always the quality of the other specialists and where they're coming from, and then of the economists. I don't share my colleagues' optimism that economists are converging on you know, a uniformly more sensible view. I have heard too many of them say different things and often in places you can't repeat it. Um, and there's that one problem. The second problem here is, uh, okay, who are you gonna collaborate with? Um, and then what you find is that what I find over and over, for instance, I've been working with a lot of statisticians since this thing started. Um, and many of the statisticians have eh, economic views I would describe as eh, primitive would be my own way of putting it, not only pre-Keynesian, but, uh, you know, in some cases, pre-Alaric uh, the Visigoth are uh, Genghis Khan. Um, and so it's like, uh, you know, you can still collaborate with them, but you got to really make them sort of stick to what they know. I mean, I'm not making this up. I've heard people just carry on, you know, as though, I mean, they, lots of these folks think savings is the thing you have to hoard, find, and then somehow unleash. Now, you know, I, 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 you all know or should know, I mean, this is YSI after all, but well, you know, you have banks uh, and they lend money. I mean, why are you saving? And, 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 and you know, you don't have to do that. Um, but, um, so I, I, it's not clear to me that they can do it. And that I would add this, is that the incentives in many fields are working badly. That is to say, look, I, in the week before the American presidential election, you could see well-known economic historians and economists writing all kinds of silly stuff. Stuff like one person said, well, Trump is being abandoned by American big business. That was quite prominent. And everybody acted like, well, the Delphic Oracle has spoken. I mean, I knew right away that can't be true. 
the uh, I mean, the oil industry, uh, the, all the heavy polluting industries. I mean, they're not going to abandon Donald Trump. They weren't going to go for Joe Biden. They didn't. Um, and come on, guys. I mean, why would you even write that silly stuff? Um, and the answer, and similarly, you get historians writing all kinds of stuff. They, they can't be bothered to go to the archives. I just wrote up a case on the INET website that was pretty prominent. Um, the, uh, and that, all the incentives are all wrong there. It's similarly true in health. You could see the pressures in the discussions about lockdowns on some of the leading, look, at one point, say, uh, about, uh, Dr. Fauci, who everybody, who's everybody's hero, was telling you, too, he was saying masks don't protect you. We all knew that was nonsense. We knew it right then. And you don't have to, if you doubt that, read Bob Woodward, you know, on uh, what uh, Trump was saying. And they didn't have the equipment, so they were just covering. This is happening in every country uh, pretty much on Earth. Um, and uh, I, uh, one thing that I, the lesson I extract from COVID is, boy, are these so-called guild or professional standards weak. A lot of these, you know, it's just amazing to me that people who are, you know, fairly far along in departments, in bureaus of health and stuff like that, that nobody would quit when people told them this is crazy. When I listen to French, German, and other statisticians talk about discussions in their countries, um, it's not quite as stupid, but it's pretty stupid. Uh, and uh, the professional norms are not holding here. So would this stuff help? Yeah, it might. If you can find the right specialists, it'll be great. If you can't, you will be deeper uh, into, uh, and, and I mean, and collaborating with, say, the average political scientist who was telling you right to the very last second that this was all about identity politics or something, this is crazy stuff. Um, now I see that this morning, even some of the folks I regard as boring oxes uh, in the field are admitting this looks like a pocketbook story. Um, anyway. Um, Thank you so much for that comment. Uh, not sure if anyone else is willing to take the floor regarding this, uh, this uh, question in terms of how can we rephrase it or if it's a relevant research question, is this something that we should be focusing on or where are we wasting our time if we're seeking answers here? Okay. We already have two other rephrasings. I forgot to mention this, but uh, you're able to change your like at this point. So if you like the original questions, but you like one of the rephrasings better now, feel free to move around your like and sort of uh, like another phrasing. For instance, now we have, uh, should economists collaborate with scholars uh, and practitioners working in other disciplines to address the challenges of the post COVID-19 era, um, which is almost taking the lead right now. So it's kind of going farther behind. We're asking if we should, instead of how. Possibly motivated by this uh, latest comment. Uh, I don't, I'd like to hear from my colleague Ursula actually, but let me just quickly, if you notice at the start of the COVID crisis in the US, one Robert Rubin wrote a note uh, wrote a piece in the New York Times saying, well, you know what you should do? You should create a, a, a committees of business guys and economists, or rather he pictured a system in which uh, economists would be working with medical specialists. That's to be more precise uh, than I just was. And, and that that would somehow work out. Boy, am I not uh, convinced on that till I find out which medical specialist. We, it turned out, you know, one hospital director, and I live in the medical capital of the universe, Boston, and one of the hospital directors then had to, the head of it had to sort of step down when it turned out she was heavily involved with guys making coronavirus vaccines that were being tested in her hospital. Um, and it, the conflicts of interest here are often very deep. Um, and as we just see in the case, well, it's actually a financial story in that uh, report on Wirecard and Baffin, the German guys, 
they didn't have standards in place to do anything about that. Um, anyway, it was a but. Uh, well, um, so I think that, so I read a lot of um, um, articles by economists uh, lately who think, well, you know, we know that economists are pretty arrogant in general, you know, human being that they think they have all answers. And uh, I think we had another example of that uh, when we saw economists trying essentially to do epidemiology or showing how good they are with complexity economics uh, methods applied to any, or some, like something else. And the point is, I think that economists, uh, many economists don't really like economics, try to do something else, uh, try to, or maybe like the, some of the methodology, complicated methodology they get to apply uh, while doing something that should be economics. So um, in a sense, I think that um, there's a lot to do in, in terms of macroeconomic policies uh, or, or even uh, you know, in terms of political economy, understanding the world. Um, so that's already a difficult task and <laughs> it should be a bit more humble uh, in a sense. Uh, and so yes, listen to other disciplines, uh, but uh, you know, and also understand that there are limits to what, as economists, uh, we can say. Because ultimately, the point, uh, which is also related to how the the, the question was phrased before, uh, why economists, as such, should have something to say about anything, really? Like, uh, are first of all, economists don't always agree. So, which economists should really get to say? anything um and then uh, you know i think that there's a, um, a blog post by alessandro roncaglia on our website from a, a few years ago that addresses very well this point and he argues that um, uh, he argues that uh, economists are just like the other citizens they should be present in the public debate as citizen, which happen to study economics and have specific views about how about economic policies as well, and other things. So, uh, you know, that's a problem of what the status of economists, which is, uh, you know, uh, maybe a bit too uh, too prominent right now in many policy decisions, uh, in a way. And, or too little prominent in others, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and then I see that there's a question about the Halevi's papers, uh, which are also on INET's website. And uh, there's uh, these three papers that came out uh, together. And the one, uh, there are, there's a blog post that, that sort of just quickly describes them all, which is called the Stormy Birth of, of Europe, which uh, links to the actual papers, so you can all find them there. I think it's the first who talks about the European uh, Payment Union and, you know, Kindleberger, as um, Tom was saying before. Here, could I add one comment? Uh, we might be, you might consider this uh, as among the many specialists you could collaborate with. We are constantly being urged big data. There is a whole school of economics now, largely centered in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and a few other places on the West Coast that are just basically telling you big data will solve all your problems. First question, tell me a big data story that's clearly compelling and so clearly obvious that, gov that governments or anybody else want to adopt it. I mean, there was a lot of talk in the uh, press about how Silicon Valley or, or big data was going to save us in the COVID. And indeed, there was a whole uh, block of folks in Silicon Valley meeting claiming they could organize things. They haven't done it. Hasn't worked. Big data. Um, I, my, my own take on it, big data is useful, provided you can, you, know, you can understand it and make ask a sensible question. Otherwise, what you get is big data is a way of giving you enormous amounts uh, of haystacks in which you can't find any needle because there's way too much hay in there. 
Um, and, uh, you know, let's, you'll know it when big data, I mean, it's big data might be able to tell you uh, if you are getting sick on an individual basis, if you can, you know, get a perfect tape of your voice or something like that, nothing like that exists for society. Thank you. Um, I think Dania was taking the floor. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if someone would mind commenting specifically on the potential for economists to be working with qualitative researchers, um, perhaps research of the variety that gives color and a lot of richness to economic modeling um, from maybe some voices that are not, not heard. Can you I will just simplify it. So my question um, is around how economists can collab collaborate specifically with qualitative researchers. Um, so prior, um, there had been some talk about, say, economists working with statisticians, um, but I'm wondering more specifically, could there be some conversation around the potential for economists to be working with researchers, perhaps interviewing people on the ground or um, things like that? Well, all right, look, I'm happy to, I, I, I wrote not too long ago a paper on the 2016 election because I was just tired of hearing it was all about identity politics. And for that, I read 35,000 interviews, uh, or at least the data uh, on those oral, uh, they're, they're coded up uh, completion, the, where they actually write down what people say. And in that sense, I was feeling extremely virtuous. You want qualitative stuff? But there is this problem. Um, I think the qualitative folks need to think a bit about how do they get, I mean, the, pro the problem is it's too easy for folks to slide past the point of a lot of qualitative research. And so it is quite worth thinking about how you can get, sort of bring in the qualitative data, which I agree is actually often irreplaceable. I mean, anybody who, does, I mean, who uses canned poll questions to get at what voters are after. You're inviting, your, uh, you're inviting yourself into the echo chamber. All you hear is your own question uh, coming back to you. And so just going out and talking to people makes sense. But I, I, I think the, quali the other side of this though, and it was a very devil of a problem uh, with all the uh, qualitative answers in the American National Election Survey, is to try to get them into a shape that you could actually um, sort of convince people who are skeptics. That's also a problem. So what I'm really telling you is I don't have an answer to this question, uh, except that everybody will have to try harder. Thank you. Um, Dania, you um, we're now going to uh, a different question in order to continue with this idea of how can we kind of rephrase or redefine this question in order to improve them. Uh, and perhaps we can uh, go back to the one about uh, if will COVID-19 change power relations among countries. Uh, so perhaps we can think about a different phrasing that is more precise, perhaps uh, how COVID-19 will change power uh, relations among countries could be a more interesting research question. Uh, I know if I don't know if anyone would like to take the floor and comment on this. Um, I know the speakers have already commented on this, but they feel free to go ahead and add some thoughts on how can we improve this research question in order to make it more interesting. Thanks. Uh, so uh, there is also that initial question that I never uh, answered to about the um, whether we should tackle the conflict itself or the, the structural elements that define uh, that create that that conflict. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I guess that that's uh, precisely the type of approach that one needs to have when thinking of policies. Like, what are the sources? Uh, of a conflict and how a, me a measure they might ease or appease certain uh, com conflicts 
do not really resolve the, the root cause. And, and the point is, uh, you know, if we have to take a Marxian approach, uh, you do not uh, appease the, the root causes. Uh, you can just uh, patch uh, them a, a little bit. Or, or this is also Kaletsky's uh, point of view, for example. Uh, I'm not sure about Keynes. Probably he himself, I think it can, uh, we can probably say that that he w was his view too. Uh, but we can also do better. Uh, so... I mean, it depends on, on which specific conflict we're talking about, but I think that that's a very good question, not easy to answer in general or, or quickly, but I just wanted to say that. Um, how it will change um, the power relation among countries? I think that it's, it's um, certainly uh, deepening some, uh, some uh, inequalities among countries. It's really devastating, uh, has de devastating effect in Latin America, above all, in uh, countries like South Africa as well, is in uh, real uh, financial trouble right now. And so uh, those regions uh, will have serious problems going forward if we don't do anything about it, which uh, of course uh, we can. <laughs> um, so... I think that that's one factor that uh, we can easily predict. Uh, as to other elements, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't really know how to, to answer further. Uh, yeah, what, one issue uh, which Tom mentioned is whether the dollar will remain uh, hegemonic. And uh, you know, I don't see that changing very quickly, uh, to be honest. Mm. Um, question also, I mean, in effect, us, you could capsulize, I think, right, a good deal of what Orsula was just talking about in the debt and monetary field. There are some serious issues arising in terms of pure technical production. Um, they might be called the Snowden problem. That is to say, uh, everybody found out, thanks to Snowden, that all of the tech equipment has back doors. And people can talk all they want about, well, they'll never use it or there's no back door, nobody believes it. You could see the world arms trade shift on that basis as companies began to, uh, sorry, countries began to realize, you know what? This guy who we just bought our fighters from might turn them off in the middle of the war. And so it boiled down, you know, uh, and so, uh, this is going to affect technical trade, trade in internet and technical stuff, not everything, but a good deal of it. It's going to boil down to, you know, who is your back, who do you want to have your back door open to? Um, and this is tricky, and it's going to be an incredibly contentious, you can see already the business between Huawei uh, and the Americans, um, and uh, I think people need quickly to sort of think about this. Um, they got to find ways that you can do the rest of world trade without turning the whole thing into a confrontation. On the other hand, this is a very general technology. Your car industry will use it and the backdoor problem will be there uh, in cars, for example. Um, and so we're just at the beginning of watching this sort out. Uh, but this is a mess in the making. Thank you so much. Uh, we are heading towards the end of the session. Thank you so much, Ursula and Tom, for your time uh, and your very, very valuable comments. Uh, we are now able to choose your favorite questions among the ones that we liked uh, the most before. Uh, unlike likes, favorites are limits, so choose them wisely. Uh, you only have 10 favorite questions for the whole plenary, although they are not set in stone, you can choose a favorite now and then change it later, that's okay. Uh, and your favorites will be displayed on your, uh, on your YSI profile. So take your time, look at the question, choose your favorites, and I would like us to give the floor to Tom and Ortla in case you want to say anything else uh, from my end, just thank you. I think just thank you from my end. I appreciate talking to folks. Thank you for organizing this and good luck on all these ventures. I mean, and I hope everybody stays healthy.
Same. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to wrap up the session. Uh, the next speaker, Serge Akarlov, will start in 45 minutes. Uh, in the meantime, there will be a break on the social island. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for this great session.